Hello and welcome back to Forensic Bytes. We're going to continue on the topic of presumptive testing in forensic science, focusing on one particular reagent, the mandolin reagent. This one isn't used particularly often by forensic practitioners, but it does feature regularly in several DIY or home drug testing kits, hence why I wanted to talk about it. So I was inspired to talk about this when I came across this news article outlining that the Student Union of Newcastle University was handing out drug testing kits to help their students assess whether or not drugs that they may have had in their possession were genuine or not. Because one of the big hazards of illicit drug use is not knowing what's in them. Home drug testing kits get around this problem by allowing you to test a small sample of the drug to work out whether or not it contains the active ingredient you expect it to be. The article's a little bit older, from 2016, and I'm not so naive as to think that none of my university students would be taking illicit drugs, and at the end of the day, the worst outcome would be for someone to get hurt taking them. Inside a typical drug testing kit, you'll find multiple separate presumptive tests. So in this one, there is the Marquis reagent, there's the Mecca reagent, Mandolin reagent, and an optional fourth, which is the Folin reagent. Also included is this chart, which provides you with the expected colour change that you're going to see for a positive test for each individual reagent. Looking along the side, we can see all the individual illicit drugs that the tests will detect, and I'm only showing around about one third to a quarter of the actual chart. So there's considerably more illicit drugs that this range of presumptive tests will identify. Also helpful across the top, you can see that there's a time scale. So we have at time equals zero, the initial color that you're going to see, and then you'll see how that color is going to evolve over 20 seconds. So most of these presumptive tests are relatively quick. And if you're going to see a change in color spectrum, like some of these down here, all you're going to need is around about 20 seconds to go through that gambit of colors. Now, despite there being four presumptive tests given, the first three, you are required to do, whereas the last one is only suitable for a select number of the illicit drugs. So that's why the last one is optional. It will only give you valid information for certain types of illicit drug. And today we're going to just be talking about mandolin reagent. We'll follow up with some of these other reagents on another day. So as far as I can tell, mandolin reagent is not commonly used for forensic analysis, at least not in my country, Australia. There is, however, some evidence that it is used elsewhere. So if we have a look over here, we have a pre-made up field test for mandolin reagent, and the website for that comes from the Netherlands. So perhaps in Europe, they are in fact using the mandolin reagent in the field. The reagent is one of the more common reagents found in commercially available home testing kits though. Given it's convenient to prepare, it is often used as well for teaching forensic science at universities, and we use it in our undergraduate laboratory classes here at Griffith University. As a test, it's rather non-specific though, so very similar to Mayer's reagent that we talked about earlier. You make it by dissolving sodium metavanidate in concentrated sulfuric acid. So looking up here, sodium metavanidate is an insoluble coordination polymer. What we need is to get that into solution so the first thing we do is we add the sodium metavanidate to a strong aqueous acid, and in this case, it's sulfuric acid. What that does is it breaks these bonds and liberates these units of orthovanadic acid, and this is soluble in solution. So this will give you a yellowy solution, and that's what we are going to use for our presumptive test. The active component in mandolin reagent is vanadium metal. Vanadium is a transition metal, which means that it is predisposed to forming coloured complexes. And you can think about it in terms of red blood cells. Blood is red because it contains iron. Iron's a transition metal, and it's what's generating the colour. So the colour that vanadium creates depends on what's surrounding that metal. And if we look here at the orthovanadic acid, the vanadium is surrounded by oxygen atoms. If we can change that by the vanadium binding to one of our illicit drug compounds, a unique colour may form. Looking now at the different colours of vanadium, we can see that it has quite a diverse colour spectrum. Changing the colour of the metal is relatively straightforward, since in its initial state it's surrounded by water mostly. If it encounters an illicit drug that contains a basic nitrogen atom, 
that will potentially outcompete the water and displace it. Depending on the strength and nature of this new vanadium to nitrogen atom binding, different colours will be generated. So now on the left I'm showing the chemical structures of five different illicit drugs, and I've highlighted in pink the nitrogen atom that can be used to coordinate to the vanadium. If we have a look over here at the colour responses, we can see that MDMA and amphetamine shown here give you the most dramatic colour changes. And the reason for that is probably that these are the smaller illicit drugs, which allow them to more efficiently get close to the vanadium metal and coordinate to it. Whereas if you look at some of the larger species like oxycodone, they're pretty big, so it's more challenging for them to get closer to the metal atom. If we have a look, the colour change goes from yellow to perhaps a darker yellow-brown colour. It's quite different from yellow to vibrant green or yellow to vibrant blue. So this wide range of binding strength gives us the diverse colours, and we can use the diverse colours to assign the drug class of the sample that we've applied to the presumptive test. Now, like Mayer's reagent, any alkaloid chemicals are going to bind to vanadium too since the definition of an alkaloid is just a small molecule that contains a nitrogen atom in it. These will also generate colour responses. Worse than that, there are other common, visually drug-like materials. So if we think about our white powders, we have salt, sugar, aspirin. Most of the white powders that you can picture that are legal, they may also give you a colour response by mandolin reagent. For this reason, care needs to be taken when interpreting the results of the presumptive test, and it's why there are three presumptive tests included in the home drug testing kit. If all three separate tests provide you results that match to a drug, the odds are good that that's what the drug could be. If only one of the presumptive tests match the illicit drug, well, more than likely it's a false positive and not the drug in the sample. So to conclude, mandolin reagent is another presumptive test with broad reactivity across several drug classes, but a high number of false positives. For this reason, mandolin reagent is best used in conjunction with other presumptive tests to allow you to have more confidence in its answers. Broad reactivity across several drug classes makes it a useful addition to drug testing kits, wherein a variety of drug types might be encountered, but it's less useful in a forensic context where you really need to unambiguously know what the identity of a drug is. That's all for today. Thanks again for listening.